Good morning, church. Good morning. Yeah. I think we're glad to be here. I'm sure as a church, we're glad to be here this morning, right? It's a beautiful day, and we would love to praise and worship our living God. And we would just request you to rise up, please, for this song, maybe. And we have three sort of songs, beautiful songs. So you may feel free to sit if you're tired, you know. If not, let's stand and worship. of a multitude of those from every tribe and town we are your people redeemed by your blood rescued from death by your love there are no words good enough to thank you there are no words to express my but I will lift up my voice and sing from my heart with all of my strength. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah, hallelujah, by the blood of Christ we stand. Every tongue, every tribe, every people, every land, giving glory, giving honor. you Lord we thank you Lord Father for the love Lord Father we thank you for this wonderful day Lord Father so that we could come together and praise you Lord Father we lift your name Lord Star, but I am not for 
forsaken for by my side the Savior he will stay I labor on in weakness and rejoice for in my need his power is displayed to this I hold my shepherd I hold to this I hold my hope is only Jesus all the glory evermore to him when the race is complete still my lips shall repeat yet not I but through Christ in me when the race when the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. And yet not I, but through Christ in me. Jesus said to send to off it all. And Jesus said to send to off it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. And Jesus, let's sing it, Jesus be the center. And Jesus be the center of my life. And Jesus be the center of my life. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, nothing else. Jesus, your center, and everything revolves around you. Jesus, 
Jesus, you nothing else, nothing else matters, nothing in this world will do, Jesus, you're the center, and everything revolves around you. Center of your church, and Jesus be the center of your church. And every knee will bow, and every tongue shall confess to you, Jesus. And Jesus, nothing else is meant. Jesus, you're the center. Everything revolves around you. Jesus, you at the center of it all. Lord, we are here for a reason, for a purpose, Lord. Every tribe and tongue, we gather in your holy name, Lord. We praise you and we worship you, Lord. We give you all the glory and our praises this morning again, Lord. Accept our worship, Lord. And as a church, we invite you, Lord, to be in the center of our lives this morning. Not just today, but every day in our lives, Lord. To be the center of this church, Lord. Because we know you are the center of it. And everything revolves around you, Lord. Renew our minds and our hearts, Lord, this morning again. Because we all come with our troubles and weaknesses, Lord. Heal us, Lord. May you bring peace. Because your love covers it all. We thank you for the songs again, Lord Father. And be with us, Lord Father, as we continue with our service, Lord. Speak to us again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A very warm welcome to all of you, to our City Church uh, Sunday morning worship service once again. It's uh, such a joy to be in the presence of the Lord together with His saints, and we look forward to receiving, you know, great blessings from God. Our spiritual life is a journey, isn't it? And uh, I'm sure we are at different stages and uh, places of our spiritual journey uh, this morning as we come. Some of us may be on the mountaintop of joy and success or just peace and we're just uh, enjoying our mountaintop experiences. Some of us may be down in the valley of sadness or bereavement or pain or suffering or just, you know, questions. Uh, some of us may be stuck somewhere in the middle in between the trees, uh, confused about life and maybe angry or slightly bitter. Uh, or maybe some of us are just stuck and confused somewhere between the verses of the book of Revelation. Uh, but wherever we may be, uh, I just want to tell all of us that we are in the right place this morning. Uh, some, one of my friends used to say, there are some things that are never wrong in this world, and going to church on a Sunday morning is never wrong. <laughs> and so you are in the right place. Uh, God has brought you here. And so let's just leave aside, you know, the things that may be bugging us down or confusing us or you know, making us a little angry or unsettled. Let's just leave that behind and sit in the presence of God. And I pray that God will minister to you this morning. God will meet you at the point of your need. God will refresh you, empower you, bring you back to Him through His Word and through His people uh, this morning as we gather together. So may God's presence be with us. Let's continue to sit in the presence of God in this um, attitude of prayer. If you're here for the first time, we welcome you warmly. If you're here after a long time, we welcome you once again. And uh, I can see some uh, new faces, also some people who have come after a so long time. But, you know, I uh, cannot mention names <laughs> because there are several of you. 
Uh, but welcome to those who are here for the first time. And maybe especially, uh, let me welcome Reverend Samuel once again. He is a pastor, Reverend Dr. Samuel, right? He's the, yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Jai Masi, yes. He's the pastor of CTCRC in Darjeeling, right? And he's also the general secretary of uh, Himalayan region missions. Uh, he, he's here uh, with Rosemary and he's here attending our Revelations uh, seminar. He was also with us yesterday in our mission seminar. Such a blessing to have you. I can also see some new faces. I hope we'll get to meet later on after the church and get to know uh, you better. Uh, we will now have a time of prayer, uh, intercessory prayer. And there are a few concerns that I want to share. And let's go for a time of mass spoken prayer together. Uh, firstly, we know our neighbors, uh, Manipur. They are continuing to struggle in a lot of conflict. Let's pray for Manipur. Uh, pray for the government God, that God will intervene and help them to rule in peace and, 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 and justice and righteousness. Let's pray for the Christians in Manipur. They may be Cookies or Metis or you know, other tribes. Let's pray that they will be bold, that God will reach out to them, uh, refresh them, that they will be bold in continuing to preach the gospel. Let's also pray for the people. Uh, there may be non-believers. Let's pray that uh, God will have mercy and reach out to them. And uh, even through this conflict, they will come to know the God of peace. So in however way God leads us, let's pray for the people of Manipur. Okay? Secondly, let's also pray for Nagaland. You know, in Timothy, God commands us that wherever the church gathers, we pray for the leaders, the kings, and the rulers and those, those in authority are government leaders, political or um, bureaucratic leaders. Let's pray that they will rule in justice and uh, righteousness uh, so that the people will live in peace and dignity. Uh, let's also pray for the churches, uh, the Christians, so that uh, in this situation of peace that we currently enjoy, uh, that the gospel will be preached with clarity and that the churches will not forget the lordship. Uh, of Jesus Christ over us, over our churches. So let's also pray for the government of Nagaland, uh, as the word commands us to, uh, so that we will live in peace and dignity and that the gospel will spread and uh, the lordship of Christ will become clear in, in our lives. Thirdly, let's also pray for the sick and the bereaved among us. There are several of our members who are sick and have been going through uh, treatment, we know them. Uh, well, let's pray for them. I also pray for the bereaved, those who have lost their near and dear loved ones among us. Let's pray. And uh, let's also pray for uh, Phil and Irene. They've been ministering to us uh, these past few days. Uh, we've been greatly blessed by their ministry. Uh, Irene is again ministering to the Sunday school teachers and the Sunday school uh, students, the, uh, the senior students. And a few, you know, Sunday school teachers uh, from other churches, I believe, are joining in that seminar. Let's pray for them. We, yesterday, we were greatly blessed. Our eyes were opened in many ways um, in our mission seminar as well. So let's pray for Phil and Irene as they continue to serve the Lord through the OMF and also through Langham preaching. I pray for health and wisdom upon them as well. Their children are scattered, two of them in Sydney, two of them in uh, London. We can remember their family. So shall we all go for a mass spoken prayer, you know, take our time and uh, pray for these concerns and others that you will have concerns in your heart, mind as you bring these concerns and burdens. Let's just pour out all our concerns and burdens to God uh, this, um, in a mass spoken prayer. Let's pray. Yeah. Oh, Father, we come to you in the name of your son, Jesus, once again, who has died for us who has won the victory, who has risen again from the dead, O oh God. And we today, O oh God, stand in confidence in your presence because of the blood of Jesus. And we stand in confidence because of the, of the victory of Jesus, Lord. All around us is pain and suffering and confusion. But we stand, O oh God, in the clarity of our faith and the victory of Jesus Christ this morning. And we come to you with confidence, O oh God. We bring before you our neighbors, Manipur, O oh Lord. We pray that you in your mercy would come and um, 
and, and touch, O oh God, the people of Manipur. We cry out to you for the Christians in Manipur, the believers, O oh God, as we saw in the book of Revelation that you have marked them, you have kept them, O oh Lord, and we pray that you would continue to protect them, and we pray that you would give them the boldness, O oh Lord, to witness even in this difficult time. We pray for the churches, that we pray for joy, for confidence, O oh Lord, as they continue to serve you and worship you in that place of conflict, O oh Lord. And we pray, O oh God, that even those who do not know you will come to know you, O oh God, to know Jesus Christ as the one who has won the victory, O oh God, over evil. And so we pray, O oh God, that they will find peace in Jesus alone. So we lift up our neighbors to you. As you command us in your word, we also bring our government to you. We pray, O oh God, that you will reach out to them and uh, speak to them, enable them to rule in justice and in righteousness, O oh God. Not in selfishness, Lord, not in corruption, O oh Lord, but I pray, O oh God, that they will, O oh God, their conscience will be pricked, O oh Lord, that they will learn to stand in your truth, O oh Lord, and rule so that your people, O oh God, the people of Nagaland will live in dignity, O oh God, and in peace, O oh Lord. We also pray for our churches that in this situation of peace, we will not forget you, but rather we will have more clarity of the gospel and preach it with more clarity and power and authority, and that we will, Lord, that your Lordship of Jesus Christ would be sin over our church, O oh Lord, even again as we come this morning in your presence. We ask you, O oh Lord, to continue to speak to us, Lord. We again pray for many of our members who are undergoing treatment, cancer treatment, chemotherapy, O oh Lord, uh, different kinds of treatment, therapy, and uh, emotional struggles and hurts, O oh Lord, uh, people who struggle with addictions, O oh Lord, people who struggle with broken families and marriages, O oh Lord, and we pray we lift them up to you, Father, you know, so we pray, O oh God, that you would have mercy and reach out to them, O oh Lord, and that they would find, O oh God, peace and healing in you, O oh Lord. We lift them up to you. We pray for the doctors and the medical advice and the treatment that they seek. We pray, O oh God, that you would bless this and so that through this you will bring healing, O oh God, and strength, O oh God, back to these members. So we lift up our members to you. We also thank you for the ministry of Phil and Irene through the OMF, through the Langham Preaching, and through different organizations and avenues they have. We thank you, Father, for the expertise, the training, and the knowledge that you have given to them so that they can use this to bless your church all over, Lord. Uh, we pray that you will continue to give them the health and the wisdom that they need, O oh Lord, as they travel around to preach your gospel and to teach your people, O oh God. So we lift them up to you. We continue to pray that you give them health and strength and, and, uh, and, and even longer life so that they will continue to serve you, O oh God, in, in even greater ways in the years to come. We thank you, Father, for them. And so as we sit in your presence, continue to worship you, continue to receive from your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit will come and uh, be our teacher, O Lord. Uh, may the Holy Spirit come demonstrating his power over our hearts and over our minds, O Lord, that miracles would happen in our hearts and in our minds, Lord, that hearts would be opened and minds would be opened and changed, O Lord, as we worship you this morning. Bless everyone here this morning, O Lord, including our Sunday school teachers and students as they sit in that seminar, including our Nagamis uh, fellowship members, Lord. We pray, O God, that you would, O God, bless us and renew us and refresh us as we sit in your presence this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. Um, we'll have a time of offering uh, this time, so I will request uh, some of our deacons and our staff to come and help collect the offering. In the meantime, we can use this silence to just talk to God, um, maybe a time of repentance or a time, time of prayer as uh, Sano plays the music in the piano. Use this time to connect with God.
the doxology is in the hymn number 16 of our hymn book if you need that. But um, if you don't, that's fine. Let's all stand and sing the doxology. Yeah. They say a Baptist church service is not complete without announcements. So <laughs> allow me to make a few announcements uh, at this time. Our, as you can see, some announcements printed here. We, uh, our Nagamis class is going on. Uh, Mego will be leading the Nagamis class this morning. Uh, well, if you have any member in your family who would prefer the Nagamis class, please send them, refer them to our Nagamis class. Okay, It happens simultaneously with our church uh, fellowship. So please keep that in mind. To our prayer and Bible study fellowship on Wednesdays, uh, we have at 5 p.m. And uh, this coming Wednesday uh, will be very special because our, our speaker, Phil Nicholson, will be continuing uh, the Revelation series. Okay, so please don't miss this. Even if you're not able to come on other Wednesdays, uh, don't feel embarrassed <laughs> or guilty about showing up, you know, this Wednesday <laughs> because you will not have opportunity like this again okay yeah so i understand we understand you know these days is really difficult to you know come apart from sundays life is getting more and more difficult you know with the traffic and everything so we do understand but this wednesday you know please come okay we will not get this opportunity and perhaps it will be another session for us to clarify our doubts you know uh, over uh, on the book of revelation so wednesday I forgot the, which day it is. Can any one of you? But anyway, it's Wednesday um, this week at 5 p.m. right here. Uh, please don't miss the opportunity, okay? Wednesday. Our Phil Nicholson will be leading the Bible study. On route fellowship, of course, on Saturday. Uh, young adults on Saturdays. Uh, young adults is every last Saturday of the month. Uh, men's and women's fellowship will continue on Friday at uh, 5 p.m. So that's all for the announcements. Uh, we have a very special song this morning. Uh, we, we, we don't, you know, get enough special songs. That's what I feel uh, in our Sunday morning services. I, so I, I wish there were more special songs. You know, it may not be the best song. You know, it may not be the best singer. But just anyone willing to sing and bless us is uh, such a great blessing. And sometimes I feel we don't have enough of that in our church. So this morning, you know, we're so glad. Uh, to, to have Maribani and Chonchani, the mother and daughter, uh, you know, to come and bless us. Of course, they are great singers. Maribani is like a well-known singer, and the daughter is following her, so we praise God. We'll give the time to them. Their song is, I Can Do All Things. Yeah. What a blessed assurance we have in Jesus Christ that in the midst of all the troubles and trials that we face here on this earth, we are marked and sealed by him, that we belong to him. And as it says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things with Christ who gives me strength. Amen. That's what the song talks about. valleys, every storm-tossed sea, I can feel my Savior so close to me. He leads me forward to paths unknown, and when my strength is gone, He heals my weary soul and shows me who I could be. I reach. 
watch out for His grace. He will rescue me. I can do all things with my Savior by my side. I can climb to greater heights, find the strength I need. I can do all things with Christ. I can do all things with Christ. Though it's far and wide When I feel the hunger And I hear the lies I will pray to heaven And the winds will cease With the Savior as my guide I know that I can do all things When I'm sinking in the waves If I reach out for His grace Thank you, Mary Bani and uh, John Chani, for blessing us with that very powerful song. May God continue to bless you and your family and use you uh, in the days to come. Yeah, we'll now have the scripture reader and after that followed by the speaker. But uh, uh, before that, you know, this is our Life Impact Weekend and uh, we've been having a series on the book of uh, revelation and for me personally it has been a great time of refreshing and learning unlearning and uh, learning and relearning and so I am personally so glad and grateful to God that uh, this is happening and uh, Phil is here ever since I met and heard Phil last year in September in Hyderabad uh, I don't know whether it was September but anyway last year somewhere in the middle part, I heard, met, and uh, heard Phil, you know, preach and teach on the book of Revelation. I have been praying, and Karen and I, we have been praying to have um, Phil over to our church to teach on the book of Revelation, and we are very happy that he has agreed to come and uh, clarify a lot of our doubts. I'm sure it is also your experience, but for me, growing up, Revelation has been a book to be avoided, right? There's a book you want to avoid. And whenever you think about it or read it, it just fills you with fear, right? And that's because we were taught that way and we were shown movies like Left Behind and given novels to read by Tim Lahefi, I think. Yeah, but by someone called Tim, Left Behind series. And so whenever, or Armageddon, you know, whenever we think about Revelation, it fills us with so much of fear. Uh, also confusion, you know, because... At, at me, class 8, 9, you know, or 9, 10, 11, I, break, I, was, I used to break my head trying to figure out pre, pre, pre-trip, post-trip, pre-mill, post-mill, <laughs> all of this, you know. Um, and so it fills you with a lot of confusion, 
And every time there is a major world event, politics, economic, or cultural, you're trying to connect that with the book of Revelation. And after one or two years, that changes again. They're connecting it with something else. And so it's really confusing. Uh, uh, and also, you know, uh, they would teach about, about the rapture and how believers would leave this world and God will just suck you out from the earth and take you to, the, to, be, to, to heaven where you will be worshipping him uh, in the clouds, playing the harp, you know, doing that forever and ever and ever. Uh, that was our understanding. And that made us feel that somehow the earth and this world that we live in is irrelevant because we're going to live it one day. So that was the understanding, you know, the rapture and all this understanding that we grew up. But this week has been uh, a really a time where many things have been changing. We are learning that Revelation was written not to give fear, but it was written, it was written to give courage and joy. You know, so whenever you book, read the book of Revelation, it should fill you with courage. It should fill you with, with, with joy. It, it gives hope. It was meant to build clarity of faith and conviction over the victory of Jesus Christ. You know, it was, you know, uh, and it was written to, to show that God has victory and has a plan for the world, right? That he, he's not going to leave it behind. And so a lot of um, this has been clarified, and we really thank God for that. And I know for those of us who have held on tightly to some of the older teachings, it will be a difficult transition, but I want to encourage you to do it with grace uh, and uh, to be open to learn new things um, and allow God to work in our hearts and in our minds, you know. So let's be, you know, open, let's be gracious as we continue our study on the book of Revelation. And so I would again invite you, this morning will be the, the sermon delivered by our speaker, and tonight will be the final session at 4 p.m. Of course, we will continue in Wednesday again, uh, uh, 5 p.m., but tonight we will, um, is again 4 p.m., uh, where Phil will open up time for questions and answers again. So having said that, we'll give time to him. But again, for those of you who have missed yesterday, Phil is... Uh, works with the Overseas Missionary Fellowship as uh, the, one of the trainers there. His job, he travels all over the place uh, training missionaries, you know, mobilizing missionaries, along with his wife, Irene, who's also a OMF, an OMF uh, missionary trainer and mobilizer. And uh, she did an excellent job yesterday in our mission seminar. It was uh, very eye-opening, a lot of things that we need to process and learn. So, so... That's Irene. She's again with the Sunday School this morning, so you're not able to meet her, but uh, tonight she'll be there. And so we are very grateful to them. And apart from their OMF uh, responsibilities, both of them are also very engaged with Langham Preaching. And Phil is also the coordinator of, for Langham Preaching East Asia. Uh, so uh, very big responsibility mini uh, and big ministry roles but we are grateful to them for sparing their time and coming and uh, blessing us this weekend. So we'll give uh, time to them. But I, you know, as I think about our events, I remember this verse in Revelation chapter 1 where it says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear, who keep, and who understand. So we are a community of blessed people. Phil is so blessed because... Uh, he gets to study it and read it and teach it to us. We are even more blessed because we are here to listen, to understand, and not only that, to obey, to keep it. You know, So we are a community of blessed people um, as we sit together to learn more about what God has to tell us uh, through the book of Revelation this morning. So without uh, much further delay, I'll give the time to our speaker. But before that, Ini will read the passage uh, for our meditation this morning. So, Ini, yeah, please. Thank you. Shall we turn our Bibles to Revelation chapter 11? Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 to 13. The two witnesses. 
I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, Go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshippers, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. And I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sack- sackcloth. They are, the, they are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. And they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying, and they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also the Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, Some from every people, tribe, and language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, while their enemies looked on. At that very hour, there was a severe earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. May the Lord bless us through this reading of his word. I want to say thank you again for the opportunity of being with you and, and sharing God's word with you. Uh, it's a great joy uh, to be here and worshipping with you in Nagaland today. And uh, particularly hearing the worship this morning, I realize Naga people can really sing. And uh, I, I enjoyed um, the first song was from right from Revelation chapter 7. It was a wonderful choice. And then the second song from City of Light, uh, what is it, Yet Not I But Christ in Me? Uh, City of Light is a church which is just down the road from where I used to live in Australia. And so coming here in Nagaland and hearing brothers and sisters here sing a song written in my home country, just a reminder again that all of us, no matter where we're from, uh, are brothers and sisters in Christ and we worship the same God. So it's a, it's a great joy and a privilege to be invited and to see how God has established his church and his people in places all around the world uh, and uh, here as well, and particularly here as I look out and see so many churches on the hills across the city. Uh, So thank you for the invitation and the opportunity of sharing with you. We're going to be looking at the passage in chapter 11 in a moment. It's a rather confusing, difficult passage on the surface, but hopefully it will be a message that encourages us again. As uh, was shared earlier, and for those who've heard me the last couple of days, you know my home is from Australia, and Irene and I were sent from Australia to serve in Taiwan over 30 years ago. And so people hear that and think, oh, well, Taiwan must be your home now. And yes, we love being in Taiwan. Uh, We really enjoy it. We feel comfortable living there. And yet at the same time, we're torn because our family and where the place we come from is a very different country. And so we feel torn between two places, where do I, where I live now and where really is my home? And I think for anyone who has moved and lived somewhere else, we feel some of that experience. And all of us as Christians actually have a similar experience. We live here in this world, but we often feel out of place because we know the world is not our home. And ultimately our home is with Christ. 
Our home is not this world, and often the world reminds us of that as we face rejection. And in many places, perhaps not so much here in Nagaland, where Christians are majority, but in most places in the world, we are a minority as believers. And so how do we respond to that? When we are the majority, we can live in our own Christian world and we relate with Christians and we feel comfortable. But when we lose power as Christians, when we are a minority, people respond in different ways. Some people will hide away from the world and, and try and form their own little Christian communities and, and cut themselves off from the wider world because it feels too dangerous. Others will try and fight. And particularly in the West now, we hear what's called the culture wars, where Christians are trying to hold on in power, to power, even as the church gets smaller and weaker in many Western countries. But as Christians living in this world, which is not really our home, what are we to do? Well, this passage that we read in Revelation 11 actually gives us one perspective on our responsibility as Christians living in this world. Uh, We need to go and look at the background again in Revelation. As for those of you who have joined us already, we need to see the big picture of Revelation. Uh, It's a book that's divided into different scenes, helping us understand our world from God's perspective. And one of the scenes is chapters 8 to 11, where a focus is on the fact that God is warning the world and calling people to repent. If we go back to the beginning of chapter 8 and 9, we see there a vision of angels blowing seven trumpets, or six trumpets, the seventh is later on. And each time they blow a trumpet, there is a plague on the world, uh, a plague that affects the natural world, a plague that brings pain, a plague that brings death. But not on all people, only on part of the world. And we see the whole theme of chapters 8 and 9 is God allows these disasters, these terrible things, to warn people to turn back to him. Jesus himself said that when people asked him, what about this tower that fell on people? And he said, that's a warning. You need to repent. And likewise, this vision is a vision of the fact that God is using pain and suffering in this world to challenge people to repent. But sadly, at the end of chapter 9, we read these words. Chapter 9, verse 20 says, The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshipping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality or their thefts. People ignore the warnings. They don't repent. But then as we read on in Revelation chapters 10 and 11, we see that God doesn't just use disasters and suffering to warn people. He uses his own people to warn the world to turn back to him. Chapter 10, we see that John, who has been watching all these visions, suddenly is given a task, and we we don't have time to look at it. But in chapter 10, we see that John is given a scroll by an angel, and he's told to eat that scroll. And uh, I'll read part of chapter 10 here. If you have your Bible, you can look along with me. But in chapter 10, verse 8, it says this. Then a voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go, take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I'd eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. This is another vision, but it's a vision that comes from the Old Testament. Often when God called the prophets, like Jeremiah and Ezekiel, they would have an experience of being given a scroll and being told to eat it. In other words, take God's word, take it in, and then they were to announce it, to proclaim it to the people. And we see that John is being given this same experience. Take the word of God, eat it, and there your responsibility is to prophesy, to proclaim God's word, and indeed here it's to proclaim it to many nations. John is being called to be a witness, to keep telling the world, to keep warning people. 
It's interesting, God opens the heavens and gives John this vision. Uh, But God could do the same thing. He could suddenly open the heavens here and reveal himself in glory to everyone. But that's not the way he usually reveals himself. Mostly God chooses one or two or a few people. He reveals himself to them and their responsibility is then to announce what they have seen or heard to others. That's what the prophets in the Bible do. And again, today, we're reminded that the way God shows himself to the world is first by revealing himself to his people and then giving us the responsibility to proclaim what we have seen, what we have heard, to others. And John has been given that experience here. But notice what the scroll is like. It's both sweet and sour. When he first eats it, oh, it's delicious, it's like honey. But then afterwards, his stomach feels terrible. It's a bit like eating chili for for many of us. You know, I love spicy food. Eating spicy food is wonderful, but often your stomach does not enjoy it later on. There are many foods that are like that. You know, they taste good, but they turn our stomach sour. And it's a reminder that the message that is given is a message of joy and salvation. But it's also a message of judgment and suffering And indeed, the speaker, the prophet, may suffer as well as he proclaims the word of God. So we see the same theme here, though, is one of warning. God warns the world through judgments, through suffering, but God now gives John the responsibility of warning the world and the reminder that when he does that, it will be both sweet and sour. But then we keep reading, and when we come to chapter 11, we have a really strange vision. But it's a vision that fits this same theme, that God is warning his world to come back to him. And so I want to explain the vision to you now and then stop and think, what does that say to us today? Uh, Because it is a vision that on the surface is, is rather strange and difficult to understand. I'll read again the first couple of verses of chapter 11. This is John saying, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshippers. But exclude the other court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. And so what we see here is firstly, the situation is that the whole world seems to be conquered by the enemies of God, described as the Gentiles. There are those people worshipping God, but where are they? They are just in the very centre of the temple. It's a vision, remember. It's not literally, but it's showing. The place where God is, the temple, his people are there worshipping him, but the outside, the world, is being overrun by the enemies of God. And so John has to measure out that place where the people of God are. And many places in the Bible and in the book of Revelation, we see people are counted or places are measured. And it's symbolically showing that God knows this place. He's marked it out. He's sort of putting a wall around it, protecting it. He knows who is there. They belong to him. They are safe. And so God's people sort of, while the whole world seems to be under the enemies of God, God's people are there safe, protected in this place of worship. And this is the context of of this vision. And we're told there that this will happen for 42 months. And again, we've been seeing that in the book of Revelation, numbers always have some sort of symbolic meaning. Uh, 42 months, uh, we can calculate easily, is three and a half years. For three and a half years, the enemies of God will have victory, which I don't think, and I'll explain more later, is a literal three and a half years, but seven, seven years is a period of completeness or even of eternity. Three and a half is a time cut in half. And where three and a half appears, it's talking about something that is not lasting forever, something that's temporary, something that's even short. And so what it's saying is this time when God's enemies are victorious is not going to last forever. It will be cut in half. It will be cut short. But there is a time where it seems like the people of God are being overrun, being defeated. God is protecting them, but they seem so weak and small. But then something strange happens. While the enemies of God are victorious, God sends his servants out into the world. Out of this place of safety, he sends these two witnesses to go 
and to proclaim his word to the world. He doesn't wait till the church is strong and powerful, but even while God's people are weak, he sends these witnesses to preach. And how long do they preach for? We read here that they preach for 1,260 days, which 30 days a month, if you do a little bit of basic mathematics, calculates to 42 months to three and a half years. In other words, representing the fact that for the whole time that God's people are under attack, are weak, seem powerless, God has not forgotten the world. God is continually sending his messengers out to preach to those who are his enemies. He's continually giving them a chance to hear and to repent and turn back. And what we see here is, we could say, a a vision of mission. The context of mission is God's people are weak. God's people are under attack. God's enemies are winning. But God still sends his servants out into the world. And the time for mission is that as long as this takes place, place as long as the enemies are winning as long as the world seems overrun by the enemies of God God hasn't given up God never gives up on the world he continues to send out his witnesses to preach and to proclaim but let's keep reading what happens we see the context is one of weakness and suffering we see the time of mission the three and a half years and the next thing we're told is the power that these witnesses have to serve God verse 5 it says this If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. In their verse 6, they have power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain. They have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. When you read those verses, who do you think of? Who do these people sound like? They sound like Moses and Elijah, right? These are the powerful things that Moses and Elijah did as they were facing the enemies of God, as Moses faced Pharaoh, as Elijah faced the prophets of Baal, that although they were weak, that they went and served with the power of God, that God was with them, that God protected them even in their weakness and gave them power to do these miraculous things, that they could not fail in the ministry that God had given them because they served with the power of God. There's then another image, also from the Old Testament, of two lampstands and olive trees. And this refers to another story in the Bible, that when the people of Israel came back from Babylon and they had to build the temple and they faced so much opposition and pressure, Zechariah gave a prophecy to encourage the leaders, two men who were leading the people of Israel. And he said, you'll be like lampstands and and you'll have the power of God, the power of God's spirit. You will succeed in rebuilding the temple. And the very well-known verse in that vision is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And so this vision in Revelation picks up all these Old Testament ideas and says that at this time God's servants will go into the world and they'll be like Moses. They'll be like Elijah. They'll be like the men who rebuilt the temple In times of weakness, when the enemies of God seem so powerful, God's power will ensure that his servants do not fail. But what happens next? Suddenly, despite God's protection, God seems to then take his protection away because we see that they suffer and they are killed. There's a paradox. On the one hand, they're protected by God, but God's protection doesn't mean they will not face persecution and suffering. And when their work is finished, this figure, uh, this evil figure comes up from the pit, uh, this beast who appears later in the book. And he attacks and defeats these two witnesses and kills them and they're left lying in the street of the city. The witnesses are dead. Their bodies are lying there in the street. And what do people do? People from all over the world come to look at them and have a party. It's like Christmas. People are rejoicing and giving gifts to one another like on Christmas Day. Why? Because these two men are dead in the street. But why are they so happy? Because they spoke the word of God, but now they are silenced. It says they tormented us. In other words, hearing God's word made people angry and upset. So let's kill the servants of God. Let's kill the messengers of God. And then we don't feel uncomfortable anymore. 
And so they rejoice over the death of the servants of God. We see this today, don't we? People rejoicing over such evil deeds. I remember a few years ago in North Africa, a number of brothers were killed by ISIS and they videoed it. And we showed them not just the the video, I didn't watch the video, but the video showed them not just being killed, but then those who killed them rejoicing and being happy about it. A deed of great evil, but people are rejoicing in evil. It's hard to understand, isn't it? But when people hate God and God's people so much, when God's people are destroyed, they actually rejoice in that. And that's what we see here, that the servants of God are killed and the world rejoices. This is a reminder that not just for these witnesses, but whenever we speak the word of God, we are going to face opposition and hatred and suffering. Jesus himself said that. Paul said it, that everyone who wants to live a godly life, everyone who faithfully preaches the gospel, will face opposition. When we first went to Taiwan as missionaries, we sort of knew, oh, it'll be hard, you know, missionaries is hard. And uh, we got there thinking we were prepared, and suddenly we realized, no, it's much harder than we ever thought it would be. We got to Taiwan and we didn't have any friends. We couldn't speak the language. We felt so lonely and out of place. And after four days, Irene burst into tears and said, I want to go home. Thankfully, God at that time really spoke to her and to me and encouraged us, and 30 years later, we're still serving. But I think my understanding then was that when we serve God, yes, there are hardships, but if we're really smart and work hard, we can avoid the hardships. But it's not like that. The connection between serving God and suffering cannot be broken because it's through suffering that God's plans are fulfilled. If Jesus did not suffer, he could not be our saviour. Paul likewise said that it was through his suffering he filled up the sufferings of Christ. It was only as Paul suffered that he could be fruitful as an apostle. And the Bible seems again and again to say that one of the ways God fulfills his purposes is through the suffering of his people. John Piper, who many of you have probably heard of, said it like this. He says, more and more I'm persuaded from the Bible and from the history of missions that God's design for the evangelization of the world includes the suffering of his servants and missionaries. To put it clearly, God designs that the suffering of his servants is one essential means in the spread of the gospel among the world. I'm saying more than the fact that suffering is a result of being obedient. I'm saying that suffering is part of God's strategy for making Christ known to the world. In other words, without suffering, our ministry will not be fully effective. That's a frightening thing for me as someone who has a role as a missionary and a preacher of the gospel. But it's something that we see again and again in the Bible and we see illustrated here in this passage that those who preach the gospel, those who say, yes, I will serve Christ, that part of that will be suffering. It's not always death. It's not always prison but there will be hardships and opposition along the way. That if you want to be a faithful believer serving Christ, you need to prepare your heart to know that the path we walk is the path that Jesus walked, and it was a path of suffering and carrying his cross. And so we see that illustrated here in this vision as well, that when we suffer, it's not a sign that God has forgotten us. It's not a sign that God is punishing us. But indeed, often our suffering is one of the ways that God is preparing us and using us to be effective in serving him. And so it looks here like God's word has been silenced. There's no more message to the world. And not just here, indeed many times in history it looks like that has happened. There have been places and times where the church has been established and then it's been totally wiped out. The early church was strong in the Middle East, but then with the coming of Islam, suddenly the Christians and churches seemed to be totally gone. When communism came to China, the church seemed to be totally wiped out. Uh, I mentioned, uh, or Irene mentioned, I think, about Cambodia, that when the Khmer Rouge came and, and took over Cambodia, the church that was there, almost all the Christians were killed. There are times when it seems that the church and God's people are totally wiped out. 
Even on a smaller scale, sometimes it feels like our own ministry and work. We work so hard and we establish something, maybe a church has started or a ministry has started, and then suddenly it's gone. There are times when it seems that Satan wins, whether it's in our own life, our own ministry, or even the wider church. There are people today who are worried that the church in the West is about to be totally wiped out. And indeed, at some stage that could happen. It looks like Satan wins often when we look at the history of the world, even when we look at our own experiences. But the vision is not finished. What happens? The servants are dead. And how long are they dead? It's a strange question, isn't it? Because when someone is dead, they're dead permanently. But not here. We're told they're dead for three and a half days. Notice, not seven days, it's not forever. The three and a half again is seven cut in half. It's temporary, it's a short time. And quite possibly using three and a half here is a, is a reminder again, it's like Jesus. It's not exactly, but the three days that Jesus was dead. And the experience of the witnesses is like the experience of Jesus. They are put to death, but let's read on what happens in verse 11. After the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. It's the same path of Jesus, of faithful service, of suffering, of death, of resurrection, and being raised up to heaven and glory again. The path of God's servants is the same as the path that Jesus took. Satan looks like he has won, but his victory is so temporary. Three days, three and a half days, and then the servants are raised up to glory. At the other side of death is resurrection and victory. And this is a reminder also that as Christians, our hope is not to avoid hardship. Our hope is not in an easy life. Our hope is not even to avoid death. Our hope is resurrection. Our hope is based in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, which tells us that no matter what I face today, even death itself, I know that beyond death there is life, new life, eternal life, because I have the resurrection promises. And so we see this here this reminder of these witnesses who serve faithfully, are put to death, but now are raised up in glory. When Martin Luther was preaching the gospel and facing the Catholic Church that opposed him and indeed was trying to put him to death, he wrote a very famous hymn that we sing today. I'm not sure if you know this hymn here in Nagaland, A Mighty Fortress. But at that time he wrote these words, let goods and kindred, let goods and family go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abides still. His kingdom is forever. They take our life, goods, fame, child and wife. Let these all be gone. They have yet nothing won. The kingdom remains ours. They can take my life. They still haven't won because I have the kingdom of God. He held on to that resurrection hope. And again, that's what we see pictured in this vision of these two witnesses. But one final point before we think about how this all relates to us today. Were the witnesses successful? As they preached the gospel, did people come and repent and turn back? Actually, we don't see any sign of that, do we? In fact, when they're put to death, the whole world seems to rejoice. That they went out as witnesses proclaiming the word of God and yet no one listened. After they died and after they were raised, there was a great earthquake and then people turned to God and gave glory to him. And it may well be that that's talking of some repentance and coming back to God. Or it may well be just like it says in Philippians that every knee will bow and recognize that Jesus is Lord. Not necessarily a true repentance and coming to God, but simply an acknowledgement that Jesus is Lord and unwilling submission to God. We don't know. But either way, these witnesses never saw any results to their preaching. They never saw great revival. They never saw many many people coming to faith. They were faithful and they were raised from the dead. But we don't know if they ever saw fruit from that. 
And again, that's a reminder that as we serve God, sometimes we don't see results, but it doesn't mean we've failed. The results, whether people come to faith or not, whether the church grows or not, we long for that, we pray for that, but in the end, that is in the hand of God. We are simply called to be faithful and knowing that whether we see that or not, God is using us as we faithfully share his word. Now, I've already been saying that as we look at this vision, we can connect it to us and our experiences today. So I want us to stop and think, well, what is this vision actually showing? Who are these two witnesses? What is it, how does it connect to us today? And actually, I think the best way in the context of the book of Revelation to understand this vision is this is simply a vision of God's people in the world. It's not a prophecy of two individuals sometime, somewhere in the future. But just like all the visions of Revelation, it's, it's a vision that's relevant for the last 2,000 years. It's a vision given to help us understand God's purposes and what God's doing. If it's just something off in the future, it doesn't really help us today. What it is is a vision of what God's plans for his people in the world are. It's not just two people. It picks up an image of two, the two most important people of the Old Testament and reminds us that as we serve God, we serve like they serve, with the power of God. But we also face the things that they faced, that all of God's servants faced, that Jesus Christ himself faced. One of the reasons I, I say this is they are described as lampstands. And when we read Revelation, we see that the lampstands are actually the church. It's not just one or two men, but all of us have that role of being sent into the world to be witnesses to the world. We see this also. The place that they serve is symbolic. It says that Sodom and Egypt and also the city where Jesus died. How can that be? How can there be three places at once? Well, it's simply symbolizing all the places where God's servants are attacked and destroyed. It's another way of just describing the world in which we live, is a world that's opposed to God. So it's a vision, I think, that's relevant for all Christians in all times. This is what it means to be God's servants. So what do we learn from that vision, just going over it again? That when God's people are weak, when God's enemies are strong... God knows his people and is protecting them. But at the same time, he doesn't call his people to hide away and be quiet. John was already being punished for his witness, and yet again he's given the job, preach the gospel. God sends his witnesses out, out of a place of safety, into a place of danger. But then what he does is protect them, even in that place of danger. He empowers them, he strengthens them so that what the, he calls them to do they will be successful doing. And yet at the same time, God also allows his servants to suffer and even die. And that is our experience too, that as we serve God, we need to know he calls us to go out even when it seems dangerous. He calls us to go out and keep proclaiming the gospel even when the church seems weak. But he sends us out with guarantees that he is with us. Jesus himself said that, the Great Commission, I'm with you always. I have all authority. When I send you out to the world, you go, in, not in your strength, but in my strength. But we go also knowing that we may, and in fact probably will, face opposition and even severe opposition and persecution. But beyond that, no matter what happens, we have the guarantee of resurrection and glory at the end of our service. And as we serve, we're also reminded we may not see the results of our service. We may not see the fruit of preaching the gospel. We get very discouraged. We hope that someone will come to faith and they don't. We hope that we will start a new church and it doesn't work. Uh, we hope that God will use us in some way, but we don't necessarily always see those results. But it's interesting, back in the Old Testament, when God gave Ezekiel a similar task, God gave Ezekiel a scroll to eat and said, preach the gospel. God's words to Ezekiel were these. He says, the people to whom I'm sending you are obstinate and stubborn. In other words, you're going to preach to these people, but they've got hard hearts. He says, say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious people, they will know that a prophet has been among them. 
They may listen, they may not listen. But regardless, they'll know that they've heard the word of God. Ezekiel's responsibility was simply proclaim the word of God and whether they believe or not, your job is done. And it may well be for us. Sometimes we preach the gospel in a place where we see many people come to faith. We see great growth in the church. Other people God sends to places where they don't see any fruit. But people still hear the word of God and God is still doing his purposes amongst them. And so what does this vision say to us today? I think it's a reminder in the context of Revelation that even while God's people are facing great persecution, even while they are weak, God still has a role for his people to not be quiet, to not hide, but to keep on preaching the gospel, knowing that these are the sort of experiences they may face. At the end of this vision, there is one more trumpet that is blown. And at the end of that trumpet, we read these words in chapter 11, verse 15. It says, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. At the end of our time, at the end of our service, at the end of the world, Jesus will rule. At the moment, we live in the time when the enemies of God seem to be victorious in so many places, where the church is under attack, where Christians are weak, where Christians suffer. We may also be called to go through those experiences. But at the end of all things, at the final trumpet sound, there's a reminder that the kingdoms of this world will be removed and the kingdom of Christ will rule forever. So this is a vision that actually calls us to be brave, to have courage. Someone said last night, your revelation makes us afraid uh, because we see these scary visions and visions of judgment and suffering. Uh, But at the same time, it's also visions of promise and hope. And yet the promise and hope is often for the future and so we do need courage. We need courage that when our church is weak, when the enemies of God seem strong, that we are still known and protected by God. We need courage to follow the call of God in our lives, to serve him and to go out even when we feel uncertain and afraid. We need courage to know that whatever God calls you to do, he will empower you to do it. That we serve not in our own strength or intelligence, not relying on our own finances or technology, but serving in the power of God. We need courage to know that even if we do suffer, that God has not forgotten us, that God will use our suffering even as a part of his plan. And we may indeed need courage that we face the worst possible situation, even death itself, but beyond that, we have the assurance of resurrection hope. And we need courage that when we serve and we don't see results, that God is still working through us and using us. This is a vision that calls us to have courage in a world that may hate us. To have courage particularly not to hide away, but to keep speaking the words that God has given us. To being witnesses that you are believers, you have heard the gospel, you know the love of Jesus Christ. And to keep proclaiming that, whether it's proclaiming it here in Kahima, in Nagaland, in other parts of India, or even outside of India. That however God calls us, wherever he leads us, that we would boldly go knowing that we have these promises, this assurance. The witnesses are not just some vision of something that will happen out there, but it's a vision to help us understand what it means to be God's people in the world today. And so I hope that as it encourages me, this is a vision that also encourages you and gives you insights. It actually doesn't say anything different from what other parts of the New Testament says, but it says it in this visionary graphic language that helps us picture it, that we might be encouraged knowing that whatever we face, ultimately we have the promises of God, we have the assurance of resurrection, we have the assurance of glory and the knowledge that one day the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this vision, again, of your servants sent into the world to proclaim your message. We thank you for the reminder that this indeed, the experiences that you call us to have as your people as well. We thank you for the promises that you are with us, 
We thank you for the assurance that even when we seem to be weak or, or suffering or failing, that you are working through us. And we thank you most of all that because Jesus has risen from the dead, we also have that assurance of resurrection hope. And so we pray that you would help each one of us to be courageous in our own situation, that wherever you've called us to serve you, uh, in whatever way you've called us to serve you, that we would be faithful witnesses, that we would speak of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that we would know that you would work through us and use us and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thankful for the word that has come to us. As much, uh, as, much as our speaker enjoys us singing, we're happy that he has introduced new songs to us. And we'll be singing one that is new uh, to, uh, to close our service. But the words of this song is adapted to the old hymn, The Church One Foundation. So let us rise to sing this uh, new song, but in a very familiar tune. And uh, let the words minister to us. Can I ask you to all stand?
Sebastian, aku pasti kira untuk kamu. Father, we thank you for speaking to us. We thank you that in your grace and in your mercy, uh, you have ministered to us through your word and through your servant. We ask you, O oh God, to give us the courage to live for you, to give us the courage to do the right thing, O oh Lord, this week, to say the right thing. Give us that courage, O oh Lord, to live differently for your sake. Give us the courage to preach the gospel, to share the gospel, to live the gospel. So we surrender ourselves to you, all the members of the church, empower and strengthen us, O oh God. And now may the God of peace, who raised from the dead our Lord Jesus, the, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, may this God equip you with everything good that you may do his will. And may this God work in you that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>